see you, success fam. It's your girl, Zachlin, and I am back with another profound conversation with one of our esteemed HBCU alumni. If you are new to the channel, welcome. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss a single lecture. I call these lectures because our alumni are preaching, teaching, and giving us great insights as they share their college to exceptional career success journey. And today, is no exception. You're going to want to pull out your notebook for some career advice, and you're going to get some wise Christian counsel along the way. And as he tells his story, I want you to note how he had dual roles, a math and computer science major, National Guard and ROTC while still in undergrad, and now has already had two successful careers, one in the Army and one in the private sector. I am talking about Lieutenant Colonel Retired Lawrence Robinson. Now, as you know, before I get into the interview, I'm going to always first pay tribute to the HBCU. So let's give it up for Tougaloo College. Tougaloo College, where history meets the future. During the civil rights era, Tougaloo was a safe haven for civil rights leaders and an incubator for ideas that would change the world. Nestled in Jackson, Mississippi, this private HBCU prides itself on mentoring future industry leaders and change agents in a nurturing environment marked by small classroom settings. Tougaloo is nationally known for its pre-med, pre-law, pre-dental, and education programs. Tougaloo produces 35% of the African-American attorneys and educators in Mississippi, and over 40% of the African-American healthcare professionals practicing in Mississippi. Notably, Tougaloo College partnered with the Jackson Heart Study Program to serve as the education and training hub to prepare students for careers in public health and epidemiology related to cardiovascular disease. Tougaloo College has an established tradition of producing graduates prepared to meet the needs of a changing world. One of those prestigious graduates is Lieutenant Colonel Retired Lawrence Robinson. Lawrence Robinson is a proud Tougaloo alumnus, where he double majored in math and computer science while simultaneously completing both the Army National Guard program and the Army ROTC program. Upon graduating from Tougaloo, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army, where he served in various roles and specialized in the Acquisition Corps, where he led multi-million dollar Army technical programs. Upon retirement as a lieutenant colonel in the Army, Lawrence has exceptionally progressed as an executive account manager with high profile companies such as Oracle, Salesforce, Amazon, and Google. He brought in more revenue than all other U.S. colleagues and was the global runner-up for sales in Amazon's federal division. Lawrence is passionate about giving back to his community. He serves as a board member on the nonprofit Future Kings, which provides education, mentorship, training, practical experiences, and mastery of 21st century technology to create a pipeline of young men from underserved communities to excel in STEM-related careers and positively influence their communities. In line with Tougaloo College's long standard of preparing students for the future workforce, he is bringing all his experiences back to his home state of Mississippi to modernize the career technical education program to prepare students for the current and future workforce. Lieutenant Colonel Retired Lawrence Robinson is HBCU success. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Retired Lawrence Robinson to the HBCU Success Show. Mr. Robinson, thank you very much for being here with us today. Oh, thank you, Zach. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for inviting me and look, having it worthy for me to be able to, to speak with you and the audience you have. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? I am doing just great. God is good. Good, good, good. I like to start every conversation with an attitude of gratitude. So if you don't mind just sharing with us maybe one or two things that you're grateful for today. I am thankful to see another day. God has been okay. great to us, to be quite frank with you. 
That's good. Well, we'll go ahead and get right into the conversation. And again, I appreciate you dedicating the time with us here today because you have a very busy schedule. So you are from Yazoo City, Mississippi, and uh, you decided to, um, after graduating from high school, go into the National Guard first. Can you help us understand why you decided to take that route first? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, there was not a whole lot of counseling we were having back in uh, high school back in that time. Of course, my, uh, my brothers, older brothers and sisters, they were all matriculated into the Army National Guard. Some of my school teachers was actually in the Army National Guard, even though they were full-time teachers. And so mm -hmm. that was really what most of uh, most of myself and some of the friends I hung around with, we kind of saw that as an opportunity to say, hey, let's go try this as well. So right out of high school, I think two weeks after graduation, I found myself heading to the National Guard for training as well. So it sounds like representation really mattered in helping you make that decision, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You use one of our favorite HBCU words, matriculate. You know, that's, that's an HBCU <laughs> word, right? <laughs> All right. So you, you eventually made your way to Tougaloo College. How did you make it to Tougaloo? Please talk about how that happened. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned, so we uh, right after high school graduation, uh, a friend of I, a friend of mine, is, actually two of us, uh, was looking at the National Guard. So we went to the National Guard, which started around June, uh, early June of that year. And we didn't finish training until around October, November of that same year. Uh, because mm -hmm. you know you have see the basic training, you have all your uh, advanced individual training as part of the field artillery unit that we were part of in Yazoo City, Mississippi. And so by the time we got back, it was mid, uh, as I mentioned, early November, uh, so school has already started in most of the colleges. So a friend of our, so a friend of mine, we just both said, "Hey, look, let's go and ride and see what these folks are doing." Who we heard was up at Tougaloo College. Some was at Jackson State. Some went to other school. So we went up to visit some of the friends uh, up at Tougaloo College. And upon driving up on the campus, I like this is a nice looking campus. Uh, it was nice day, beautiful day out in the yard. So people was hanging out, and I got a chance to talk to some of the folks here and. They told me how the school was, and and I looked and like, you know, why am I not here? <laughs> I want to be a part of this as well. Uh, yeah. On that same day, because it was like a Thursday or Friday, if I recall, and of course the admissions office, all these offices are actually open, so I ended up going over to the admissions office, uh, who was actually an Omega Psi Phi. I was an Omega back then, but I went over there, talked to him, uh, and he, I talked to some of the sisters. They started talking about how Tugla was and what Tugla was about. Uh, they say, what is your grades like? I, you know, I talked about my grades and they were able to go and call my school and get all my grades right off, right off the bat. And they okay. looked at it and said, hey, why aren't you here? And to make a long story short, Zach, and I was filled out all the paperwork. They've done everything they need to do. Gave me even a partial scholarship to come to Tougaloo College. And in January of the following year, January 80, I was found myself uh, on the campus of Tougaloo College, not as a visitor, but as a student. That's awesome. And what I love about that story is just how nurturing our HBCUs yes. are. Like Absolutely. they didn't just say, oh, fill out this piece of paper and we'll get back Absolutely. to you. They took care of you right there on the spot. And you were a an A student in high school. So you obviously had what it took to be in college. So they saw uh, a lot, a lot of potential in you as well, too, and said, yeah, come on in. So that's, that's, that's great. Um, yes. For that reason, is that why you chose Tougaloo? I mean, did you think, hmm, let me explore other options or were you just set like, okay, this is it for me? Yeah, when they opened my eyes, I actually, you know, we, we we heard about Jackson State, we heard about Alcorn, we heard about Mississippi Valley State, because there was a lot of football schools back in, our, in, the, in the South. Uh, but when they pulled me in, and, and as you mentioned, kind of gave me that, the ability to say, hey, you should be here, you could be here, and they've helped me to get in. It really seemed like I owe you all to be able to come here now, mm -hmm. and the best I can offer you is to make sure I finish. And that was really my, my, uh, my, thanks back to the school is to make sure I was yeah. able to finish and then be responsible now for bringing other students in. So I still owe Tugla a whole lot. Great. So why did you choose the major uh, math and computer science? 
Ah, uh, now that's a very good question as well. You got a lot of good questions here today. So I, could, uh, <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, but I, I took that out. I took the idea of mathematics, computer science. As I'm, it was a dual degree program because I was intrigued about computers. I thought computers would be the way to go in the future. And so we didn't offer a math and a computer separate degree. It was a combined dual degree. So that's how I ended up having a big, heavy concentration on math, even though I wanted to look more into computer science. Right. And as you just mentioned, this was in the 80s. So this is when computers were really becoming the big yep. wave. And so you had great vision to see yep. that, hey, this is where I need to be concentrating my efforts because this is the way the world is going. So that was Absolutely. very smart. So what were your career aspirations? Did you know at the time what you really wanted to do or were you just following an interest in a subject at that matter at that time? <laughs> I was following an interesting subject and my intent was to work in the field of computer science uh, okay. that, you know, because I knew about IBM. Uh, and they were kind of, you know, that was a big mainframe. So you heard about IBM. So I was following more of my interest at that point. Got Not it. All, I wasn't deep into what all the different things you possibly could do around that. So that yeah. was really, uh, that's the reality of it. Yeah. And I think at that point, you can't really know everything, right? Because nah. there's no way, as, as we get ready to talk about your career, <laughs> there's no way young Lawrence knew to, you know, to think about all the things that he's done, right? I think about it. I'm from the <laughs> city of Mississippi. There wasn't a lot of computers back there to do to look at the, right. how does that really apply? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the day in the life of a, a math computer science major at Tougaloo. What was it like for you? I mean, the pace, um, the intensity of the classes and things like that. Can you give us a, a, a brief overview of what that was like for you as a student? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful class uh, because it was really not a large class. Early on, when you when I started taking some of the initial math, I mentioned, as I mentioned, I, sh I kind of started in the pre-cal and and advanced math er subject area. I didn't jump to the calculus, but those classes were larger. But as we start to get into the calculus one, two, three, four, the linear equations, the math computer science degree was very small. I think we had probably about 14 or 15 people in that entire math uh, program doing in my class. And of course, by the time you get to the second year, it was looking at them, these the whole structure in, in from all classes from 10, 11 through 12, we probably had about maybe 15 to 20 max in the entire program from, from uh, junior to seniors. Um, and so really what that meant was we were able to really have access to the lab, to the teachers. Uh, we kind of uh, found ourselves being sort of a cohort where everybody who was in the class was going to pass some way because we depended and we trusted each other. There was a lot of things I didn't know but my classmate or my peer knew about that. So we found ourselves spending a lot of time in what we call Kinshlow Hall. Uh, it was, we used to call it uh, Kinshlow University because that's where you spent all your time. If you was in the math or computer, or if you were in the sciences program, you mm -hmm. spent all your time <laughs> in that building. It was open pretty much all night, if I recall. It was, <laughs> so we got in there, we probably had some classes, but we stayed in there, we worked with one another, we tried on the different boards. I know, uh, there's a couple of people I still regret it uh, and dead it to the day because they really taught me a whole lot. Uh, but she was very, she was one of my, the one of who taught me a whole lot. So she knew this math very good. So the intent was the classes was very small. The structure was very caring. They stayed with us. Uh, we didn't have to compete with a large student. We weren't just a number one sitting in a class of 100 people. Uh, we were one in, we were one of 12 or 13 or 10 in each of those classes. So, uh, but the work was very, very tough. Uh, but it was staying here, work with us, work with the instructors until you know it. That was kind of how they saw it. And that's how that's the way we saw it as well. Good. So I often say that HBCUs are where calculus and culture combine to create Black professionals. Mm -hmm. Can you give us maybe a cultural lesson or something that you learned at your time at Tougaloo that, you know, maybe didn't mean anything to you at the time, but reflecting back, you realize like, wow, I'm very grateful that I got that lesson. Yeah, that, that happened quite often. Uh, I mean, even with my math teachers early on, there was two teachers, uh, Miss Richmond and Miss Riley. I still know the name very good. Uh, mm -hmm. They actually, went, because I started early on in the lower math subjects and I kind of knew them, they actually had me doing some tutoring with them as, alongside. So 
because I was in there with them and I was actually in the math lab with them as students was coming in, they looked at me to say, hey, won't you tutor them? Because normally I would step back and say, no, you, this, this is not my job. You guys are the teachers, you tutor the students. But yeah. what they were doing, they were like letting me come in and say, hey, no, you know it. And by me, by them putting me out in front like that, it made me aware that I need to know what I'm talking about because these folks are depending on me. So let's make sure I can capture. So typically when you know something, you want to hide back and don't really have to put it out there. But what they were really doing is putting me in the spot. I don't call it a spotlight, but they was putting me on the spot to say, hey, if you know it, you should be able to teach others. So I was really there in the math lab with them because we had a lot of students coming through trying to mm -hmm. understand the basic part of the math. So that they actually did a great job in terms of putting me out there in front to let me be able to explain the process, explain the things to the students that was coming in for help. Uh, so that was one aspect. I think the other aspect that I would look at is when I was taking statistics. But I remember missing class one day and the statistic teacher actually came to my dorm and he knocked on my door and I opened the door. I was not expecting a teacher to be at the, at the door. And he said, <laughs> Robinson, where are you? Where were you? You didn't come to class. <laughs> and so it made it and that gave me the importance to realize, yes, I'm on my own in college, but these teachers are also looking to say, we have to be successful together. In order for us, our school to be successful, I need you to be successful. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. And again, that again, it's a testament to going to an HBCU. And as, even as you mentioned, your math department being so small, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they noticed when you weren't there. And instead of just turning a blind eye, they said, let me go see where he's at. But to go to your dorm, that's that's that <laughs> extra step. So he, I have he never missed a class cared. after that. If I had the opportunity to, <laughs> I didn't. You know, because yeah. on, on those campuses, it could be very sunshine and be pretty. But from that day on, I don't recall ever saying I'm just going to take for and miss a class I, yeah. I, because I thought they cared enough to come to me. So I should care enough to make sure I go into 10th class. So it woke me up quite a bit. Literally and figuratively, it woke you up. That's good. So let's let's take a moment and have a, a fun question here. So okay. take us back to your time at Tougaloo. What's a song that when you hear it, it just takes you back and it's like, ah, oh, I remember those days. And you can't say Atomic Dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a... Uh... A song that we used to play a lot is called Ain't No Stopping Us Now. Uh-huh. We're on the move. Yes. That, it was it was a song that kind of resonated early on because once you start something and you can open up the door, you open up the light, you know, it's almost like the vision, the light is there. Because I wasn't really clear about what education would do for you in the future years. Yes, we finished high school. But once your mind is open and you see the potential and opportunity, the old ideal is ain't no stopping us now. Because from Tougaloo College, I was trying to find every way of getting the next certificate, the next degree. So it was a way of saying, I'm not stopping. And that's what Tougaloo really means to us, meant to me as I looked at getting that first degree under my belt. It wasn't no stopping us now. <laughs> I like that. That sounds like it has been a mantra for you and throughout that your was, life. That was it. And I and I and as you asked that question, I thought about that was a song that I remember <laughs> back in school and I remember yeah. getting out of school and I kept saying that to myself. And mm. to you just reminding me here just today about I remember that putting in my head, ain't no <laughs> stopping us now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to put you on the spot, but I know you to be a great singer. <laughs> Can you sing it? Can you give us a little ain't something? Ain't no stopping us now. We're on the move. <laughs> All right. I love it. I'll make sure to include it in the description box so everybody can go jam with young Lawrence and, and develop that same mantra. So thank you for that. That's great. <laughs> So we mentioned before that when you uh, left high school, you first joined the Army National Guard. Mm -hmm. While you were in undergrad at Tougaloo as a dual major, math and computer science, you continued with the Army National Guard and you also joined Army ROTC. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to us 
what the difference is between National Guard and ROTC and why you pursued both while still earning your Bachelor of Science. Yeah, so when I when I left high school, as we talked about, yeah, we, I signed up, went to the National Guard. Uh, of course, my training went from early June to almost late uh, November. So that's a lot of time, a lot of hours I spent mm -hmm learning all the military uh, things, all the, all the things about the military, how to be a weapon, how to qualify for all the things we got to do to protect them, uh, our country. And so because I went to the National Guard, I was able to get, uh, advance beyond those first two years. So that pretty much put me in my junior year of ROTC. Uh, Army Reserve and Army are under the under auspices of the uh, Department of Army, whereas your National Guard is under the Army, but it's really responsibility is it, uh, for that state. You can get called on upon to be uh, to get deployed as part of the army, but for the most part, you you belong to the state. So when I was in ROTC, I was in a, as you mentioned, a dual membership program. As we look at, as I looked at the the balance between going here as an enlisted person who was now protecting this country as part of that team in the National Guard, I was also preparing now for what I would have to face as an officer. As I uh, as I matriculate to the regular army or the or the uh, the or the larger army, uh, so that's hopefully that gives you an answer question in terms of the differences in the two. One is preparing you mm -hmm. for the actual regular army. The other is preparing you to be the you only meeting once a month. You're meeting on the weekend, and then sometimes you meet probably like a three or four day weekend, and then the summer you have your two week rotation. So I did that the entire time that I was what I was going through the mm -hmm. ROTC program at Tougaloo College. Right. So it sounds like the National Guard was more for a state level and mm -hmm. ROTC is for the Army, which has a global mission. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. And so also with ROTC, it prepares you to be commissioned as an officer should no. you choose to go into the Army. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Got yep. it. So can you talk about what you gleaned from that time in undergrad while being in the National Guard and the ROTC? Um, certainly, I, I think there was a lot of leadership and things that you were mm -hmm. leadership skills that you were learning there. Yeah. So can you yeah. talk about some of those things that you learned and how it was complementary to what you were getting in your academic part at Tougaloo as well? One of the things I got from, from them both, it was take care of the people, mm -hmm. trust the people know the people. And let, let me tell you why I say that, because uh, I share with you that many of the teachers that taught me in high school were actually in the National Guard. They may have been a staff sergeant or a sergeant first class, but yet they taught me in high school. And now here I am coming back in as an officer over an ROTC. I'm still meeting with them during the National Guard once a month training. They're my teachers that at some point I would be outranking them in my head. But for the most part, these instructors, those, those teachers over there were really mentoring me because they gave me opportunity. They didn't really have to follow me in the National Guard, but they put me in a position to say, hey, we need you to start taking that, that role here. And so they respected me and they saw me different because of what I would become because I was part of the, I was in ROTC. So from that, it really realized that I need to respect people I need to mm -hmm. trust people. I need to treat them fairly because the same people that you're going to be leading are the same people that's going to, that you only lead when people are following. If mm -hmm. you're not leading, if you're, nobody's following, you're leading, but you're not leading anybody. You just think you're leading. If you know that folks are going to follow you, then you are a true leader. So mm -hmm. having that relationship to where I grew up with my teachers teaching me, and now that my teachers are putting a lot of trust in me to say, now you're going to be the leader one day, and they started putting me and sort of shaping me to become that confident leader that I will someday be as an officer. Because it's easy to go in and say, hey, you guys are now 40 something years old. Here I am coming in at like, you know, what, 21, 22, and you want me to lead you. It can easily become something you say, no, I'm not comfortable with that. But what they were doing was shaping me to make sure that you are comfortable, you know it. They probably could do the job as well, but they're not, that's not their position. Mm -hmm. Somebody got the lead and somebody's got to be followers. And these teachers did a great job of, of, of building that into me, not just the teachers there, but several of the folks who are my family, friends, they've been involved with us. We, you know, this was, you know, this is, yeah, as we said, it's a small town. I knew pretty much a lot of folks that were there and pretty much everybody outranked me because we okay. came in later, but I, I saw the relationship. I saw the family member. I saw the teachers 
And there was a lot of trust built there. Right. Well, and what it sounds like, I want to clarify one thing. When you say your teachers, you mean your high school teachers, not your college teachers, teachers, right? (laughs) Right. um, Mm -hmm. Right. Your high school teachers. But also one thing you pointed out there is, you know, you can be a leader, but if you don't have anyone following you, you're just, you know, on a piece of paper. And and that's the difference between leadership of authority and and leadership of influence. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's that's very good that they were cultivating that. So after you completed your your Bachelor of Science in uh, Computer Science and Mathematics at Tougaloo. You also, upon graduating, had already completed your time with ROTC as well. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about when you graduated from Tougaloo, why you decided to pursue an Army career? By the time I got to my junior senior year, I was starting to get a little bit more understanding of what the bigger Army was like. Yes, I went to National Guard out of high school, but now understanding the structure, understand what the Army does, the different branches. Uh, So I started to have my peers who I was having in ROTC with at Jackson State in Tougaloo. So we got to see a lot of it. And I was actually looking forward to it. Yes, I was getting some offers to go to industry right out of high school. But of course, because I was ROTC and because ROTC starts pay a little bit of stipend for a person like me during those junior senior years once a month, that worked out very well. But I also owe them a commitment now uh, because they were paying some of the uh, some of the stipends to me during my junior senior year. And so I was looking forward to joining the Army after my uh, college graduation. And also, Zach, and I, because I finished early, I was commissioned uh, a semester before I, mm-hmm. I actually finished. So by the time I finished in December of 83, I ended up going straight to the uh, to the uh, Army in January 20, uh, 1984. Wow. Okay. So you were commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Army. Yep. And can you talk about um, the transition from college to Army? Because I would imagine, like, you've been on this campus where you've had all this freedom, you do what you want to do. <laughs> And now you're going into a very rigid and structured environment. Mm -hmm. Just briefly, can you just talk about that aspect of it? Yeah. uh, I I believe Tugla prepared me well. Remember I told you about how this teacher came and got me because I missed class that day? Yes. And they realized no one's going to be watching you all the time. But there's a consequence for doing things that you don't do. So I I took it up on myself to always be accountable and be mm-hmm. responsible. So leaving Tulu after the many years uh, that I was there and now going into the Army, yes, it was a different culture because I'm in a leadership role now. And then at that point, I knew that I could probably shortcut some things, but I wasn't looking to shortcut anything. I wanted to go through the things that I was supposed to do. I wanted to keep my nose clean, not just for the sake of being clean, but that's how you grow. That's how you learn. You really have to be accountable and be and hold yourself to a higher responsibility. So that transition to the army was even greater because you have to hold yourself mm-hmm. to be responsible for your people, be responsible for the things the army, you know, the army entrusts you with a lot of things as a second lieutenant. They're entrusting yeah. you with people, material, equipment, and you can't take that lightly. So you have to be conscious about what you have up under your uh, up under your authority. Right. So on that note, when you first joined the Army, um, it's a very mission oriented Mm -hmm. assignment that they give you that is not really tailored to let's see what Lawrence can do that he specializes (laughs) in. Right. So it was about 10 years before you really started applying that math and computer science degree that Mm -hmm. you gained from Tougaloo. So at that point, you had the opportunity to go into the Army in a functional area or also known as a core, and you chose the acquisition core. Can you mm-hmm. talk about what acquisition means in the army and the role that you played in that? Yeah, you make some, and I like the way you you shape that because you're right. the The needs of the army comes first. So as you mentioned, 10, 11 years into the army, after I had my uh, my platoon time, my my company commander time, and some of the other uh, key things that the army wanted me to understand. I was able to jump in what you mentioned as well, the acquisition core, which means these are the folks who's going to be building the next weapon systems that the army or the next rifle or the next vehicle or the next uh, missile defense system that the army folks need in the field. In order for me to know what the army needed and how we need it, I had to do my time first 
of those 10 years you talked about, to be in the field, to see the issues that's in the field, to see what the needs of the soldier in the army must be. So by jumping into the acquisition core, that means you're now between industry and the rest of the army. We need you to work with industry to bring in what we need for our soldiers to be able to operate and utilize, which means you can't bring in something that our folks that are trained on because we won't be able to fight with it. And you need to bring us in the latest technology, the, the latest things that, that will help us uh, to be able to, uh, to, to defeat our enemies. So in that, you mm -hmm. mentioned that there were a lot of weapon systems and things that you were responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, and in these roles, you were responsible for helping develop these systems mm -hmm. from the ground up. And as you said, being that liaison between the army and industry, finding the right industry to come in and help build the platform based on the requirements of the army. And some of these, for people to understand, I mean, these are multi-million dollar projects and we're not talking like, oh, two million. We're talking like <laughs> 60 million, <laughs> you know, 80 million. We're in the billions right? on some of them, yes. <laughs> right. So you definitely had a huge responsibility there performing that mission. And through this time, you also earned your Master of Business Administration at Webster University, which I would imagine the Army took care of for you. Is that correct? Uh, the Army took care of that as well, yes. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> Ain't no that's stopping right. us now. Remember that song? They are like, wait, let's get this as well. <laughs> that's right. Listen, I'm all about using all resources available to get the education. No student loans. I love it. So, um, in that role, though, where you were where you were serving as like product manager and things like that in those roles, can you talk a little bit more about that time and what you were doing? Yeah, as as a project manager, many of them was in the what I call the intelligence side uh, because we're building things like the next space system. We're building the next intelligence system for our soldier baby collect and tell on all the things you see around like UAVs and, and drones and those things. Those are all things. Uh, these are things that we need to have built to be able to, for the myth, for the army to do its mission. And mm -hmm. so a lot of my portfolio programs when I went into the acquisition core was around the mission of the Intel. How do we collect? How do we communicate? How do we, um, uh, what, what is the next ground system we need for the soldiers to be wearing certain things, but yet collecting intel? So, th as you mentioned, those are those are many uh, multi-million dollar programs. Uh, so my my responsibility there was really from what I call from end to end. What are the requirements we really have to have? Making sure that we can document those requirements in a way that be able to be that we can pass along to some industry company that's going to build this for us. And now tracking that along the way to make sure it's meeting the requirements. You don't want to give them something that comes back 50% of what you really needed. Sometimes you had to satisfy for 85% because some things just wasn't there today if you wanted to get it out in the field. So there was a lot of negotiation going back and forth. Right. And when you're working with multi-million dollar projects, but mm -hmm. also remembering here, the mission is some soldier's life, right? Exactly. You want to make sure you're you're getting everything right. So that was a huge exactly. responsibility. You yeah. mentioned some skill sets in there. You mentioned negotiating skills. You mentioned mm -hmm. contracting. Um, it sounds like a lot of business acumen is involved here. Now, we just talked about you getting the MBA, but things like negotiating skills and some of those intangible skills, but then also those hard skills in the government, like contracting. Can you talk about how you learned those during your army career? Being hungry for knowledge is really uh, what it comes down to. Because, you know, if I was sort of doing some contracting things before the army sent me to contracting school. Okay. Why? Because it, it and sometimes the army does that intentionally because they want you to see what it is that you need to learn. To send me straight to a school that when I haven't applied it yet, it may not catch on quick. But because I was able to do some of that work, like the contracting skill, negotiating skill, when I go to school, I'm learning the right way to do it better, which means mm -hmm. I'm bringing experience to the classroom. It's not just you showing up in the classroom and letting the instructor teach you everything, because that's the way the classes were. Everybody bring in their experience to a classroom environment. And then when you share that knowledge, that's how we become stronger. And to be honest with you, that's how policies are made based on what's really the tangible thing that's happening in the field. It's not somebody just teaching something and you don't know how to apply it. I'm yeah. telling you how I had to go through all this here. And that person's telling you how, not that it was the right way, but you're shaping 
the best way of now doing something in the future because you're talking federal acquisition regulation. Some things people go to jail on. And so you mm-hmm. have to be clear about how to keep the army out of legal battles, how to keep industry from putting themselves in a, in a compromised position and even putting yourself in your people. So it's a lot of things that I think, but to, to answer your question a different way, as I look at opportunity to learn something like negotiation, the contracting, you have to do some reading. You have to take responsibility to learn those things so that you can be smart about how to apply it. Yes. So it sounds like it was a combination of classroom training and on the job training. Oh, but as you also said, that hunger and just a little background here. You come from a large family. How many siblings? Oh, it's 14 of us. <laughs> so you learn negotiating skills when you were a kid. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Save me some food, please. <laughs> If you save me some food, I'll go cut the grass for you. So, <laughs> right, and so that's the thing, though, right? I mean, we're joking, but that I, I want people to understand how life experiences like that play a major role later on. And you're like, wow, how do I know how to do this? Because you've been grown like this all these years. That's all and, you, and you, never, and that's, you never knew that you, you don't know that that's what you're learning, but you're right. I was 12. I was 12. I'm way down the line of 14. So there's <laughs> okay. a lot of folks I had to negotiate with. Oh, can I sleep in the bed over here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you were doing so well in your Army career um, that you were promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Mm-hmm. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, that is to be an officer in the army is one thing, but then to be able to be promoted into that ranking, um, it's not something that everyone is able to accomplish and being an African-American in the army and getting to that ranking as well too. Can you talk about what it takes and what goes into being recognized at that kind of level in the army? Uh, Innovator. I would say one of the, you know, when you know what you're doing and you know the mission, there's always ways of doing it better. Mm. And so there's two ways. You can complain on why we're not doing it this way, complain about this, or you can be the innovator and say, here's how we could do it better. You don't, no leader wants to, you don't want, nobody wants to, to come to have a person come in and tell them how bad things are. They would love for you to come in and tell them how bad things are and here's what you're going to do to fix it. Yes, so you're almost that. saying, here's a problem we have today that this is why we're not working this. But don't worry about it. Here's the solution. If you just drop a problem off on my desk, do you realize I got a whole lot more problems? So really being able to say, I'm coming in to you, not with just a problem, but I want to be part of the solution. And they're going to say, you got it. What do you need from me? Go for it. And when you put yourself on a spot like that, Zach, you have to accomplish it. Here's the problem. When you open up a door like that, are you ready to really go out there and challenge yourself to get it done? Or are you ready to just keep talking and you're ready to keep complaining? Because the, the thing that we have to understand, it's easy to complain, but it's hard to dive in there. It's hard to get in there and dive in because now you become the problem if you don't get it fixed. That's right. No, that's an excellent point. Yes. Solution oriented um, yeah. conversations are always the best to have when you're at work. You offer a lot of great career advice. Were there leaders and mentors? You don't necessarily have to name them, but you know, were there leaders and mentors that were helped helping you cultivate this mindset? Yes, yes, it was uh, quite a few. And, and I think I, it goes back to just coming out of Tugelo College was a great experience uh, because what I end up finding out as well, my the people that mentor me, doesn't matter what race they are, they saw what I was able to do. Mm-hmm. They saw the good that I had in the potential and they came forward. And they pushed me in position. I've had positions, Zach, and when I was a lieutenant that I shouldn't have had until I was, I shouldn't have, should not have had until I was like a major. But I was thrown into those positions because they trusted you. But they, so which means they were doing two things. They're telling you, you can do it. But I also knew I had a little bit of rope to say, to, to fill a little bit, but don't fall completely. Because yeah. why? I can always say, well, I wasn't, that was a position higher than me, but I wasn't looking for that out. My intent, what my intent was to go in there and be successful to show that, hey, even though this is an 05 position and I'm doing it as an 03, I'm going to show you that I can do it. And it wasn't an ego piece. It's just letting you know you're building confidence in your own self to know that 
they're putting trust in you. If they put you in a position, make sure you don't let them down. Do everything you can to say, I can do it. And trust in yourself to say, I can do it. Because as you come out of that, you're going to be put in position, or I would put in position even beyond that after our military career that I thought, hey, I don't know how to do this. But I said, yes, I do. Be confident and go out and figure out what it is you have to do. Learn what you have to do and believe in yourself that you can do it. So I've heard you say three different times now Mm -hmm. about wanting to make sure that you didn't let people down or mm-hmm. that, you know, if someone is investing in you, you want to make sure that you follow through. You said that about Tougaloo. You said that about <laughs> your high school teachers in the National Guard. And you're mm-hmm. saying that about your Army mentors. So mm-hmm. that's just a, a theme that I'm picking up right now mm-hmm. from you is the, a loyalty and a respect mm-hmm. for those that champion for you. And it, it just, it's, just it's, it's coming through. I don't know how else to say it, but I respect that. I, respect I didn't realize that. it was coming through, but you're right. It's coming through pretty clear. <laughs> it is. And there's something to be said about that because yeah. when people yeah. recognize that you value what they're giving you, mm-hmm. that trust that you talk about turns more into more trust mm-hmm. and more confidence to want to give you more. It's the yeah. humility of it and yeah. the not wasting of anyone's time, you know? Yeah. So I, I think yeah. that speaks volumes yeah. about you, your character, and, and of course, how well you've been able to do in your career. Yeah. So as we just mentioned, you were promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and one of your final positions or your final position in the Army before retiring at Lieutenant Colonel was as a Deputy Director of Cyber and Information Systems in USDI, which is the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. And when we say intelligence, we mean like information. That's basically what intelligence is to the government. Mm-hmm. But in that role, you were the deputy director of cyber. Mm -hmm. Again, we talked about how in the past you were involved with cyber, space, electronic warfare, different weapon systems. Mm -hmm. But all this time, you know, you've had this computer science and math degree from Tougaloo. Mm -hmm. These things don't necessarily use exactly what you went to school for. How Mm -hmm. are you learning about these various technologies? And do you think that just learning the foundation of science and math help with that as you were going along in your career? Absolutely. That, uh, you know, when I was in school at Tougaloo, my thought was, oh, I'll be programming something down the road. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the career field that the Army needed. Yes, I know how to talk it. I know I, I understand the importance of programming. I understand how the programming, all the math computer works to make systems work. So when I had industry talking to me and I'm learning things, I knew behind it was a lot of STEM stuff, the stuff that I took in it, but I wasn't the person building or doing all the zeros and ones that goes into the computer science. I was a person that's probably leading some uh, some acquisition or I was a person trying to drive the acquisition of something like that. Uh, so so my experience, my, my college degree was coming to fruition clearly as I started in the acquisition piece. So again, I knew about the technology. And so from that on, technology changes over and over. From what I took in college back in full, co- doing programming around COBOL and Pascal, that programming language, I knew about the programming language, but it was outdated by the time I got to the acquisition core because we were doing something a lot more innovative. We were doing using more recent technology. So having that foundation to where I understood it, it kept me moving forward to understand what the new software is, what the new capabilities are, what the new things are. So my mind was always open because you're right, even today, Computers are doing some things, artificial intelligence, robotics. Uh, they don't need humans to do certain things. So I think it was opening my mind up. But and I think it, it was a definite applying to the jobs that I had in the, in the Pentagon. Yes, yes. I found that when we get in these STEM roles, mm-hmm. you may or may not go directly into what you majored in, but it develops a mindset for problem solving and understanding STEM matters that Mm -hmm. can be applied just about anywhere. And so I think you're a testament of that because again, the math and computer science were applied to cyber, space, electronic warfare, all of those different areas. All of those things, yep. Yes. So you retired from the U.S. Army as Mm -hmm. a Lieutenant Colonel and transitioned into the private sector. Um, Can you talk about what that transition was like for you and how did you find the area for your career path that you felt, okay, yeah, this is, this is me, this fits. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, 
when I got ready to leave the Pentagon, you know, I was I clearly remember going out to Tyson's Corner. There was some kind of job fair there. I left the office for a little bit because I think we had a lot of stuff going on. I was just kind of a lot of frustrating things with what the movie slow. So I just it was really for me to take a break, just ride and go home early. But instead okay. of going on, I went to a job fair. <laughs> was, okay. I got there about two o'clock. The job fair, no, it started at eight o'clock. I wasn't really looking to get out exactly. I was just going out there to say, let me just see what's out there. Okay. Uh, and I went out there and really had a that the resume wasn't very good because I wasn't preparing my resume to get out. It was just I Wait, had I'm something. sorry. Can we stop for a second? This sure. is deja vu. You you just visited Tougaloo just to see what was out there. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're visiting a job fair to just see what's out there. Go ahead. <laughs> That's deja vu all over again. <laughs> and Go so ahead. I was I wasn't looking to get out, but when I drove out there. And I went and walked around to the many booths that's out there. And I remember this young lady from Oracle uh, who was calling me over and said, hey, how you doing? She started talking to me. Now, I heard of Oracle, but I didn't know not a whole lot about Oracle. I, I knew it was a database. That's it. And Oracle was used in the systems that I was, you know, that I was acquiring to bring in. But that wasn't for me to learn. That was the Raytheon, the Lockheed that that was running my programs. They dealt with that. I didn't deal with that. But she called me over and she wanted to look at my resume and she started talking. I told her what I was doing. And she said, can I have your resume? I'm like, sure. She just want to have my resume to check the box. <laughs> so okay. I, gave my, I gave her my resume and she looked at it and she started talking about it. You know, I'm trying to pick up what she's trying to say. Uh, and I think that was probably the only resume I passed out when I was out there. Uh, maybe one or two more, but I wasn't really looking to do anything but just come through, put something out there and go home. And, <laughs> of course, the few days after that, Oracle starts calling me. Uh, and I can name names, but great guy. I appreciate him pulling me over. But they started calling me and they said, hey, let's have an interview. I went through the interview. They had lunch with me. They were saying, you are you could really be good for this position we have coming up as a chief of staff over here and uh, as part of Oracle National Security Group. And I said, OK. And I just want to see what they're going to come up with. They start, you know, that's when I had to understand. Remember that whole idea of negotiating? Yeah. Now, with the military, I knew what my salary was going to be. But mm -hmm. now in the industry, they're saying, hey, let's talk about your salary range. I'm like, oh, that's new. <laughs> right, I had right. an idea. I had an idea of what I should ask for because of all the people that was getting out of the military. Say so you ought to look for this, look for that. So they was giving me pointers, but I think I was still low when I when I initially put the value on myself. But about a week later, they actually said, "Hey, we want to make you an offer. We want you to come over here and work for Oracle." And I was all honest, like. I can't get out right now because I have a commitment to the army. I have another, I think I had another nine months to go in the position that I had okay. as an acquisition person. Every time you start a new job as a, as a field grade officer, like major and Lieutenant Colonel, you owe them so much time. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I really can't get out. I was just kind of going through and seeing what was out there. And they mm -hmm. said, well, call us back when you're ready to get out. Cause I think we're going to have something for you. And sure enough, I'm thinking, sure. That'd be gone by now. And maybe about nine months, even 10 months, because I didn't get out right away, I sent an email back, say, look, I'm thinking about getting out. What do you guys think? Say, hey, we're ready for you. Wow. <laughs> so, okay. Well, that's quite the impression. That was, I guess I did. That was, a, that was a God impression, to be quite frank with you. I guess God knows, hey, you come over here. I'll have something for you. You'll come back when I'm ready to bring you back over here. And, uh, and the door was opened up into industry. And in that industry job, I learned what I was doing as a government employee because, again, I'm an acquisition guy. I'm contracting. I'm doing the programs. I'm trying to manage these programs, making sure we meet costs and schedule and getting the right things. And so I had a lot of relationships with folks within the Intel community, within the DOD community. And so that was really part of what they wanted me for, my knowledge, my experience. And how could you now take what we you know that you have and help us with what we're trying to do for the Army's mission. So really taking my experience within the military, learning what Oracle was doing for the military, and then now saying how could that be applied to help the mission of, uh, of, what, of what we were trying to do. It's all mission you, Yeah, I love how you phrased all that. And they saw you as a value-added contributor because of all the knowledge and the network that you yes. were bringing in. So. Yes. That that speaks volume. So you chose or 
they put you in a, a sales slash kind of business development type role. And throughout your career, your career in the private industry post army, that has been the field that you've prim primarily been in. Can you talk about what sales and business development means in the private industry? Yeah. And it's not like people think, you know, yeah, cold <laughs> calls and knocking on the door. What is sales <laughs> and business development? That was a, <laughs> Very, that's another good question, especially for the audience that that because I was coming out of this and I really didn't know it was a sales role. Mm -hmm. They said it was really business development. And I said, OK, I said to myself, I don't have no sales experience or no business experience. But when I because I was so quick to say that because I didn't understand what it all entailed. When mm -hmm. I look at the entire aspect of what I was doing in the military, my entire acquisition career, they gave me a program. They gave me budget. But guess what? I had to defend all of that. It wasn't that the program just came in my lap. I had to go and defend for budget. I had to find out what was my requirements. What does the Army need? Based on what they need, I had to go back and come up with a plan of how I'm going to use the money. I'm positioning things. I'm saying, here's what we can solve here. So I'm really creating the space. I'm creating the, the necessary things to take back to the folks in the Pentagon, which I was one of them, to say, here's what we need. Here's what we can have. And here's how we're going to get you there. I was doing all of that exactly as part of a program manager or a product manager because it was a constant budget fight. It's always so much, it's not enough money for everything you want to do. So, which means you have to have a program and defend and show a real cause for why I should pay you this money on this program instead of me giving to program C, D, X, or, L, or Z. So, I was really selling my program to the leadership in the Pentagon and to the entire Army staff to get the fund that I needed. So now transitioning into what I call the private sector, you're doing the exact thing, same thing. You say, here's what we do. We are a product company like Oracle. We have a great product. How does that product help me with my mission space? How does that product help me with the needs here? So knowing what that product can do for the mission, I just took the same exact thing back and said, hey, here's what it's going to cost you to do that. Here's what we can do for this mission. And eventually I realized, it's not really selling. It's just what you know the, the needs of the Army may be or the Air Force or the Navy. So I was going to all the different services at that point to take back and say, here's what we should do. We can do for you and here's how we can do it. And that's where they were looking for me to be innovative. They were looking for me to come in with different ideas. The government looks for industry to come to them with creative ideas on their technology. And that's all I was doing. That's a lot that you were doing. So um, <laughs> I love how you sat there and realized, like, wait a minute, I have been selling and this is a transferable skill that I'm bringing in. I just didn't yeah. call it that before. Yeah. Yeah. And also having the knowledge base of understanding how all that worked in the government was highly valuable to the industry that you were working yes. in it's because crazy. you understood the language, the lingo, how things work. So all of that was working together very well. So that's great. Yes. So in your industry career, you have gone from Oracle, Salesforce, SAIC, Amazon, and now you're with Google. Those are some big, heavy profile companies. How is it that you were able to move from company to company like that? Can you talk to us about those transitions and give us maybe some career development conversation in there? I want to go back to that song that said, ain't no stopping me. I know stopping us now. Okay. <laughs> because as I start to learn the technology in Oracle, great technology great things that they're doing and they pay me very well to be able to come up with ideas and to be able to help their company grow. And so I want to make sure I, I preface this something first. Every time I'm going to a company, these are for-profit companies. So you have to walk into these companies saying, how can I help you grow? What am I going to do to help you grow? With that mindset, Zach, I'm always seeing myself as a valuable asset, more so than somebody coming in and thinking, Oh, I'm going to be, you're going to have to pay me some money. I'm not adding value. But if I'm going to help your company grow, I look at, I have something to offer you. So going from Oracle to SIC, it was a new challenge. Everything that I moved, in some places, the company just probably just cut down. They reduced force with me. I was out the door because the whole business department went out. I'm not going to say it's all pretty out there, but the intent was always knowing what you can offer the company that you go to. What is that company about? Are they... Is it a company where you can really say, I like what they're doing and I see how this can apply to the clients that I have or the mission, especially me being around the entire federal government. 
how does this product now fit the needs of the federal government? How does it fit the Army? How does it fit the Air Force? If I can justify why that product is so great, it gave me the energy I needed to say, I know how to supply. And each time you, I, I go based on what my beliefs is, how I see the product, and how to see the maturity of the company. In everything you do, try to do it well because you, when I, you find out how can you help the company grow. So when I left the army, I went over to Oracle, stayed there for about nine years, went to SIC, then I ended up going back to Oracle for another three years. And really, the only way you're able to transition like that is to do your job extremely well, but then build that network of trust and relationship with people, because the same people that you're probably working for in this company here, they would probably start a spinoff of something like, for instance, Salesforce started from a spinoff of Oracle. Mark Benoff said, you know, he talked about cloud. Mark Benoff went over and started his own company, grew to a big, big company. And all of a sudden, there was people from Oracle now who went over there to join him to work that product, which wasn't in competition with Oracle. It's more, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a parallel with them to do something, not the same thing, but something in a different space. And that, that those leaders went over there and they also say, hey, we need this guy named Lawrence who was over there as well. I think he can do a great job for this area here. And so we was, I was really building a network of relationships and then going over to each of these companies. It's a matter of saying, do I trust the person that's going over there? Am I trusting that they're going to be the person who really can drive the next piece, can drive mm -hmm. the growth of this here? Because every company wants you to grow. They want to grow. And they'll bring you over to say, how can you help me grow? Whether you create, whether you're just doing some, a program, whether you're developing software, develop the software in a way that's going to say, I'm going to develop this software, but I'm also going to develop the next iteration of this software. I'm going to the next, the, the next iteration after that. You always have to think beyond where you are today to say, how can you help them drive and how can you help them grow? The more I've done that exactly, very few times have I put in for a cold resume just sitting on the streets. It's been really me knowing where some of the folks that went to this company, Salesforce, and now some of these folks went to Amazon, they're actually pulling and calling me and mm -hmm. I'm doing the resume after they've already told me, hey, I want you to come over here. And so right. the resume was just a process of making sure that we do all the checking in the block. But I've had a relationship with them and they knew the type of work I could do and how I could help them grow. That is excellent. And I love how you said that. And I, I, I want people to understand, especially the college students and the young professionals out mm -hmm. there, that eventually that's the goal. You want to get to the point where someone's calling you about an opportunity and you're not having to be the one to put yourself out there looking for the opportunity. Absolutely. And it also goes back to a thing that we've always heard, don't burn bridges, right? Because you oh, never absolutely. know. You don't never know who may be the next you know, Jeff Bezos or whoever, right? <laughs> be careful with your social media because you stick something out there about a company and that comes back to bite you because Ooh. now they can, they'll find out what you said and like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to bring that person in. So I'm always careful to be careful what I put out there. And as you said, so eloquent, Jack, Zach, exactly. Do not burn any bridges. You may not That's like right. the company. It's not that the company is bad. You may not like the person that you work for. Just walk away in a graceful manner because that's the way God, sometimes we can want to fight back. Let it go. Let God deal with that piece. And I go off into, into the next sunset. <laughs> Do not burn any bridges. You may not that's like right. the company. It's not that the company is bad. You may not like the person that you work for. Just walk away in a graceful manner because that's the way God, sometimes we can want to fight back. Let it go. Let God deal with that piece. And I go off into, into the next sunset. So my, I, I want to ask you this question real quickly. How do you leave a company? How do you tell Amazon, thank you, but now I'm going to Google? What is that conversation <laughs> like? <laughs> is this a... Uh... It's, it's, a, it's a conversation that if that's a very good question for especially the artists, especially as folks, because sometimes people think I'll stay with this company until until they fire me or I'm going to stay with this company 40, 50. That probably doesn't happen very much. Right. Uh, many of the, many of, the, of the jobs that I've taken with these companies, they've given me a sales role, They've which means I'm coming in and I'm you know, they can title it whatever you want to. You can call it this. You can call it an executive. But at the end of the day, they were looking for you to drive some revenue to let the company grow. So because I'm there for a period of time, they would bring you in and say, hey, look, we want you to come over for four years. They'll give me, you know, the, the, especially the Amazons or the Google. They'll say, we're going to give you some stocks. As, part, as we grow, you grow. 
the reason they're giving you stock is because they're bringing you over there to for, to do what? Make the company grow. I'm accepting the stocks because I believe that I'm going to help you grow. So if I help you grow, then what you give me later on in stock option, I'm setting my own salary in a way because I'm going to make sure this stock knock it out of the park. So yes, you're going to get that base pay. You're going to get that commission pay of things that you do over a period of time. But the stocks are very important. The question that you ask now is how do I tell a Jeff Bezos or an Amazon that, hey, I'm going to another company? It is a, That's the relationship we have. It's not a, there's enough work out there and enough companies out there for all of us to be, for all these companies to be successful. I would tell people, I'm not Jeff Bezos heir, so, <laughs> but I work with him. It's a great company. He's a great person, but I'm there for a period of time to help him to grow. But when I see at some point that, hey, I've been here four or five years, I want to do something else now. I want to probably start and make another company or another product grow. That's the excitement. That's the energy. The energy never comes from being status quo to where you say, I'm going to do the exactly the same thing for the next 20 years. It can be boring. You don't care. There's no ideals. So you stay on top of your game by always saying, this is great. I've achieved some great things here at this company. And guess what? I have an opportunity now to do it again for another company and do it differently. The reason I go to another company, because some things I may have done here, I want to try it this way now and see if I can make it even better. So yeah. some of those is saying, yes, the pay is going to be great and better. But I also know that I have some things I sh didn't get a chance to do here that I now hope to do it over here. I love how you said that when people are passionate about their career, mm -hmm. money is I learned this in leadership in leadership training. Money is not a motivator. It's a satisfier. Right. It's a satisfier. And, yep. you know, when you're passionate about what you do, you want to yep. be challenged. You want to go make something else grow and, and get better. Right. So I appreciate that your career path has been driven by a passion versus money. But of course, yes. it has come along with it because you're great yes. at what you do. But it also it sounds along. like in your industry, it's kind of expected that someone like him is not going to stay around long once he satisfies what he needs to do here for us. No harm, no foul. We understand you're wanting to move on because we're probably wanting to move on to something else as well, too. <laughs> the, but, the very top people can move on. They could, they, they right. long, no longer the CEO. Now they're over here. It's because they found another challenge. And that's the drive in most of us, that the folks who really want to be out there to drive something, it's about what can I do for the people and what can I do for the company? Yes. Another thing is you met, we I pointed out that you're very loyal to people, but then there's also this balance where you're like, I'm not too loyal. I'm not as heir, right? So I love this the balance where you you don't overdo it in any kind of way, and and that's that's great. So during your time at Amazon, you did so very well in your business development and sales role that you were uh, nominated and came in runner up for Global Salesman of the Year for the entire uh, federal division of Amazon, which is no small feat. So congratulations mm -hmm. on that. Um, can you talk about the criteria that it takes in order to be recognized at that level and to go up for such a prestigious award? Yeah. And I, I think first, I always going to make sure I thank God for that particular award because it was yes. really all God. So coming into Amazon, we were trying to drive what we call our partner business. We had to make revenue grow uh, because that's how Amazon was looking at it. We're going to we're going to grow to the billions by making sure our partners understand the technology, understand and driving that to the various contracts that the government have. So we started a group uh, and uh, we call it the. Uh, federal practice, but it was a federal partners. Who are these partners who are now operating in this, in our government space that I have to make sure that Amazon is the key and the top of mind as they drive their implementations for the government. So we started, we call our federal partner business. So my role was to come in and get these federal uh, partners of ours, the Duke, the Deloitte, the Accentures, the Northers, the Raytheons, to, to really take our technology and drive them to the, uh, to, to the government. The way they set the criteria is that we're going to give you this quarter, and we want you to knock it out of the park. If you knock it out of the park, because that's where your commission comes from, so everybody wants to knock it out of the park. But right. on top of that, you want to go even beyond that because you get the accelerators on top of that. So under federal, I we I you know had some pretty good accounts. God opened up some great accounts for me, and I was able to achieve my 
hundred percent go way over that. You got at least try to get to hundred percent. So if your mm. quota is one million, you want to bring in a million. If it's quota is ten million, you want to at least get to that part. In this case, I was going to be above and beyond that each and every uh, quarter, almost every year. And so the uh, we call it Amazon Global Public Sector. It was Global Public Sector under Teresa Carson. Uh, I was under the federal group, but when you take the entire global picture of it, I was probably one of the top sales leaders uh, doing that for, for her entire team. So yes, I was running up. I can't remember who the person that won it, but it was a different country <laughs> who won okay. that. Okay. Well, so was, you won for the U.S. That's major. I, I guess you said for the U.S. I won. But that, and you talked about the percentage. And so if I remember correctly, you were on like the 220% return. So that yes. is quite impressive. And again, building on that Army career and everything that you had learned there, you're bringing that into the federal sector of Amazon and knocking it out of the park and being up for the global salesman of the year. I mean, that that's, that's major because Amazon is not a small company. So you, you company. had to outcompete a lot of people and you did for the United States. So congratulations to you, Thank you. on that. Yes. And so now you have transitioned even after that great success at Amazon. You're now at Google. Um, but now, even as you are continuing to work in the private sector and you're doing a lot of great things in STEM, you're also leveraging that in the community. So can you talk about your role as a board member in the nonprofit Future Kings? I, I can. Uh, I was approached some several years ago about Future Kings and what Future King is doing. So uh, my whole story, as I shared with you, Zach, and where I uh, didn't quite have all the dots I dot, dotted and T's crossed in terms of where I wanted to go, especially as a uh, uh, person with black and black and brown color person like myself. And so I see that in the minds and the face of a lot of our kids today to where uh, they won't jump into the STEM field. They won't jump in it because it sounds like it's too hard or it just seems like it's too hard, not knowing that they really have the capacity and the potential to do it well because most of them, have, they are bright-minded individuals. So what Future Kings does, I'll share a little bit about that, is, is really to go into these communities, find those type of kids and get them to start playing with it and experiencing this type of uh, technology early on so they see that, Math applies this way. Computer science applies this way. If you notice in my interview early on, as we were having this discussion, I didn't really know exactly how all the mathematics worked behind the scene. I just knew at some point I want to be in that area. But had I known how it would have applied, it makes my learning of mathematics a lot simpler. Yes. Because when you're trying to learn something that you have no idea of how it applies, it makes it sort of tedious, boring. You start asking the question, why am I even learning this stuff? What does this have to do with me and my field that I'm trying to go into? And what we try to do in Future Kings is to get them uh, get them kind of excited about that field early on. They're doing things like drone development. They're doing things about cyber. They're doing things about biomedical science. They're doing those engineering things because they play with the technology all the time but they don't have a, an awareness of how does it apply or even what degree I even need to go after to do this type of thing down the road. So Future King has really been an impact in, 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 in these kids' lives. And I see that potential. So I, I decided to become a board member of Future Kings to see how can we shape this and help it grow, not just here in the Virginia area, but even beyond focusing on these, uh, on what I call our uh, black and brown kids here. That's excellent. That is excellent because, you know, there's always a push to get into STEM because we're underrepresented. But mm -hmm. what it sounds like is y'all are tackling why we're underrepresented. It's the exposure and the application, as you said, to kind of get away from that intimidation of STEM. So that is excellent. Can you talk about some of the areas of STEM that you all are focusing on? Yeah, the, 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 the four areas, we have four areas we're working right now, not to say we won't pick up another one, but the idea was uh, we're doing cybersecurity, mm -hmm. uh, we're doing engineering, we're being biomedical research, and we're doing game design. So game design is a big one because kids play with games. Yes. They're, a, they're a consumer of it, but they're never the person who's managing and leading the efforts to make the games. So we're doing, we're doing game design as one of those that kids really like. But I think a lot of our kids also now are seeing how engineering work. We're building 
uh, like a drone. We're building things like uh, the something that flies that the kid can say, well, I made that fly. Because think about how airplanes fly today. Something as heavy as that, kids have no idea. But to know how the science and start to see how I can potentially be a part of that innovation down the road, that's what we're trying to open up the door. Our biomedical research is really, really powerful, mainly because most of what we hear in our communities, you're a nurse or you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. But there's so much in terms of the medical pipeline about research, all the things that goes along to look at all the COVID. Future King was actually part of the study. We had a grant when doing COVID to figure out how do we study because we're studying the dynamics within our communities. And so we had kids being a part of that. We have a rare disease that one of our kids had uh, have in our Future Kings program. And it's that person under the tutelage of one of our bio research uh, engineer uh, scientists, he's actually, we're doing some research around that. And so we're learning those things because our kids need to know how does the things that, how does our uh, DNA apply to future research? So yeah. using those kids to start to study their own and understand how research works, it has really opened up a lot of doors for these young men and women. I love that. You're giving them purpose behind it, you know, mm -hmm. especially when there's someone that they can like sit next to and they mm -hmm. see how this research is impacting that individual. Right. That's more than just application right there. I mean, that's uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. That's purpose. And I love the game design because as you said, yeah. so many of them are playing video games and yeah. now they're looking at their video game differently. It's Absolutely. not just a console, but how does this work and how is that happening inside there? So right. that is excellent. In the description box, we will be sure to include the website for Future Kings mm -hmm. um, and the process for applying to become a Future King and to contribute to Future Kings will be at, on that website. Thank Let you. Us, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you were, you are a a board member on Future Kings. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what what role do you play there? What what is your job there? Yeah, board members really is to is to expand the uh, the operation. So we have one person, Dr. Eric King, who's been a great job, fantastic person and and his vision, what he's doing. My job as a board member is how do we get industries, how do we get funding to partnership to make it grow? There are so many organizations who's looking to do things to give back or to make an impact in these communities. What we got to do is make sure that we're asking and requesting, uh, just like we talked about on the program management side, the budgeting, what is it that we could do if you gave us this type of funding here for the impact? Every company wants to hire black and brown skin colored kids. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they need that kind of diversity in their workforce. Plus, they need the thinking of how we look at things and how to go out and market to that group. So in order to do that, they want they want that workforce. So our job is to prepare these kids to know that they can go into that workforce and then to be ready as they go into that record and to that type of uh, workforce as well. Yeah. So again, it sounds like those same skills that the mm -hmm. army built up in you mm -hmm. that the private sector has used are now also being leveraged in the nonprofit arena. So that's very good. Yeah. That business acumen, that networking, the negotiating mm -hmm. skills. I love it. how it's just full circle right now. Full so circle. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's you call that's the circle great. of life. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. On that note, you are also leveraging your experience, particularly from your time in Amazon back in your home state of Mississippi to help build the curriculum there for students. Can yeah. you talk about what you're doing there and how that came about? That's a very good question. I appreciate the opportunity to share that. Yes, I have been going back and forth to my home state, Mississippi. Uh, I'm living in the Virginia area now, but I have really, that I still have a passion. That's my family there. That's my home. Uh, so about a few years ago, Amazon built a facility in the state of Mississippi with one of our fulfillment centers that sits off of Interstate 55, if most folks understand where Interstate 55 is located. But the school, the schools in the, uh, in the state of Mississippi, especially in the Canton and the Jackson School District, they're looking at that and saying, hey, we can have some of our kids to go over there as interns for Amazon. And they were looking at doing that through what we call the CTE program, which is the Career Technical Education Program. Back in our days, back in my days, at least, it was called Votech. It's where mm -hmm. you had the brick mason, the, the warehouse, and the, the auto mechanics, uh, the woodwork, and all those type of things that was, that was offering kids skills. 
And so they reached out to Amazon. Amazon, some kind of way, realized, hey, Lawrence is from Mississippi. And they reached out and I got onto their email trail. And next thing you know, I was saying, hey, can you come down and talk with the state of Mississippi about Amazon? And Amazon invited, I mean, uh, the state invited me. I get to this meeting here and they were, this is several CTE directors across the state. Mm-hmm. Was, they were looking at how do we find more jobs for our kids to go to? Because everybody knows Amazon as being the place where kids can work in the warehouse, they can move shipping around. And so they asked me to come and be a part of a gap presentation they were doing in the state of Mississippi to say, how do we get kids to go to Amazon? fulfillment center. Mm -hmm. And so when I got there, I listened to a whole day's presentation. Uh, They talked about how the kids are 16, 17, 18. We know they're not going to go, they're not going to go right into a certain type of job because they're not old enough. But at the same time, they're preparing these kids for the workforce that's around them in the state. Mm -hmm. As I look at what they were preparing the kids for, you know, my, they were trying to get, uh, they say, hey, can Amazon take some of these students over here? And I looked at them and I said, and they asked me to speak. Let me take it back. They asked me, hey, can you come speak? Now that you heard us talk about it, can you come speak to us? And so when I got up to speak to the so many, all the different uh, CTE directors, one of the questions I asked was, which was a rhetorical question, haven't you all heard of Amazon? I assume everybody heard of Amazon. Who haven't? And so right. all the directors raised their hand and said they made some jokes. Yeah, they, they get my stuff to me on time. So everybody in the room, you can imagine, raised their hand. The next question I asked was, OK, great. How many of you in this room heard of Amazon Web Services? Mm-hmm. It was crickets. No one heard of Amazon Web Services. Yet this is the so what I call the foundation of how Amazon moves. Everything is technology. Everything you do about yourself, what you shop, your shopping experience is all the foundation of what we call the cloud and how to take all this data and manage the experiences of people like you and I in terms of how we shop. Nobody has heard of that. And so that put a red flag in my head to say, we're preparing the kids, the workforce, and we're preparing them the same way that we did in my generation, which I left high school in 1979, which is you know, there's a brick mason here, there's this over here, and we're preparing the kids for factory type jobs like an Amazon fulfillment center. And I had to let them know the Amazon fulfillment center is not a lot of people sitting around pushing and picking up boxes. Most of this stuff is auto, is is automatic, is, uh, automated, robotics, and we have a lot of BPM type things. Are we preparing our kids for that type of environment going into that? So from that, I started looking at the type of jobs that the, that that our CTEs in the state of Mississippi are preparing the kids for. They're not preparing them for things like the CISO certification or cyber certification, the Amazon or the Google or the Microsoft certifications. And so my challenge was, I need you all to prepare the kids for the real workforce that's going to be around for the next centuries and, ne- and not those that are dying away. Mm-hmm. So I got engaged with the state, state, T, state CTE, I got involved with the superintendent of Canton School, and we've had several different discussions. So the, the goal was, how do we get this type of technology so that these kids who's coming out of high school can walk away with some type of certification that's going to open their minds up beyond just working in some factory? Nothing wrong with the factories, nothing wrong with working in those supply places, but that real workforce is, is going to be evolving, and are we ready to evolve with that type of workforce? I love how you had the exposure to be able to say, you know, this is an antiquated way of doing this. Let Absolutely. me help you all yes. develop and get there. And, and you know, they probably would not have known had you not come there and explain that to them because the web services is, you know, really somewhere else. Mm-hmm. They only knew of the factory kind of yeah. jobs and things like that. But even mm-hmm. inside, they weren't aware of how things are being automated. So mm-hmm. kudos to you for doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, mm-hmm. leveraging your experiences there and, and again, negotiating skills and all that to yes. get them to even <laughs> buy into doing it because they could have said, eh, whatever, yeah. you know. And, right. And notice I said early on, find a gap. What is, it, yeah. what is the gap? No, just like any program, what is the needs right now? And you say, well, I got a solution to how we can do things better. 
I could sit there and complain all day about how the kid is a lower state, the state ain't doing this, the state did it. Or I can come up and say, hey, what you're doing is good, but we got to do this because that's where things are evolving. And how can I help you to make that happen? It's always looking to roll your sleeve up and dive into it if you're going to make things happen. So kudos to you for being a problem solver, not just sitting back and complaining, but doing something about it. And again, you know, being a home state um, alum and doing very well in your career, I'm sure added to that conversation as well, too. But it also means something, I think, when someone who resonates with the community can come back and help the community as well, too. I saw that our education is ranked low in the state of Mississippi. So how do we help? How can I help now? drive some of these innovative things that we can now put in front of our kids who are in these C2E programs that will open their minds up and spur their minds to go into these type of fields here. Because taking my, you know, when I looked at the Votech program, we thought it was for kids that wasn't going to finish school and they weren't going, they weren't going very far. But as I look at what we could start offering in these CTEs or Votech centers is a lot more. We can offer an, an Amazon certification or Google certification or get those kids to play with some drone or some robotics? How do we start getting them so that we're preparing them for the workforce down the road, Zachary? On the topic of the certifications, you know, you mentioned, and it it, it sounds like it, it also is an antiquated mindset as well, too, that, you know, CTE or VOTEC are for people who are not necessarily going to go to college, but there are a lot of people who still pick up a trade, even with a college degree. Um, yes. I know people who still have a college degree and a full-time job and still love to do a trade on the side or yes. the trade becomes their business, you know? That's, that's exactly <laughs> it. Yep. Right. So the certifications that you are helping bring to the state of Mississippi, um, those are after-school programs. Is that correct? That is correct. That's after okay. school program that we're doing right now. And one of them is like a Google, Google certification because okay. we realize when kids get certifications like Google or Amazon or, or Microsoft, Azure, that opens up a whole new job market. Yes. Why? Because every company and, and most of all of our companies are moving toward that type of technology. So if a kid has that type of certification, they may matriculate over to a junior college and get a little bit more of that certification and another year after one year at that junior college or even without going to a junior college, they're really ready for the workforce. And because the idea is to open their minds up, to empower them to open their minds up and see the art of the possible and then take that now and get more certification because that is the way for the future. Yes. Yeah. No, that's excellent. You know, I just love how your steps have been ordered throughout <laughs> your entire life and full circle brought it back. Yes. to the state of Mississippi to help yeah. your home state. You know, you are an excellent leader. You've been a good uh, counselor and mentor. I like to ask people the type of books that uh, they have read that have been foundational in their leadership and their mindset or books that you would recommend to others. And I, I hate to put you on the spot, but can you give us a couple books that you think have been very helpful to you or that you think would be helpful to others who are developing leadership skills um, and problem solving skills and negotiating communication skills? The way I would answer that is early on in my career, yeah, I did read a lot of leaders books. I was a military officer, so I read Swarth Car, had a book. Uh, we had Colin Powell has a book. I've read some of those because I wanted to learn the leadership styles because that was the military structure that I was under. But as I look at today, exactly most of my books that I've been reading over the last several years have been books on faith, mm -hmm. books about my Christian walk. Um, the book that I read uh, that I really have a lot of interest in right now and I share with many people is one book called Fan or Follower is are you a fan of Christ or are you a follower of Christ? Because what happens is we can all be fans of something and not do anything about it. I can cheer for something, but never get in the game. Mm. But to be a follower, I will have to listen and see what I'm supposed to do, understand how I can make an impact, and then go do it. Because yeah. even in the Word of God, it tells us to be doers of the Word and not simply hearers. So it's easy for me to sit back and read something and say, I like that, and that's all you do. 
But it's one thing to read something and then take really what that means and go out and do it. So, so when people ask me what is my favorite book right now, because of where I am today and I see where God has brought me from, it's a fan of follower. Am I a fan of Christ or am I a follower? Because to follow Christ is really hard because it tells us to do certain things, but we don't trust it. We mm. trust what the world is doing. And so we try to do what the world is doing instead of doing what Christ asks us to do. So that book, as well as everything else I do in life, is right there. It's tied all in together. And sometimes we don't see it tied, but it is definitely tied into what we do in our everyday work and everyday life. The reason I look at that type of book and I look at more books that gives me that strength, because if I have confidence in my faith and I have, it's not in me, it's in the God that I serve, which is that faith. And now that's what allows me to empower myself to do even more. It's that spiritual journey that's going to do a lot of the empowerment and not you trying to get self raid empowerment books. Yes, I can read a lot of folks' journey, but that may not be my journey. My journey is from a godly perspective. And I and I do look at a lot of those type of books now with in, in my in my walk today. You know, why do I want to give back? Because that's exactly why he came for the ultimate sacrifice. So when you really take yourself, you know, it, all the things that I've done so far, and I appreciate you uh, highlighting some of those things about my experience, but all those experiences was not for me to just sit back and give myself a pat on the back. It's how do I now take that experience and do exactly what he had to do and show us the way, you know, when he came on earth, he didn't really do a lot of admission work until he was in his thirties. So he had to go through the same experience. So now when God takes us through certain things, through certain jobs, yes, I love to be on this board. Why? Cause I believe I can help this board out in terms of getting the funding. But at the same time, you got to live your life in a way that people are going to see what you do and not just listen to what you say. That's profound. And I appreciate what you just gave us. And it sums it all up. Not just that they hear you, but they see you and you're going back and making some impact. That is excellent. Right. Mr. Lawrence Robinson, <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Retired Lawrence Robinson, <laughs> thank you so very much for the time that you dedicated to us today. Mm -hmm. The wise counsel, the Christian counsel, the career advice, the leadership, and for just sharing your story with us. I thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, my thank my Tougaloo family who actually put something into me, invested in me. And really, uh, I, I take it all the way back to my roots there. And I always going to look back and say, that's exactly what I needed at the time. And so how do we do that now for the same kids who are coming up? Our HBCU has been a tremendous impact for our, for our community. It has been a very impactful uh, uh, thing in my life. So I, I appreciate you having me on this show, Zach, to talk about my experience and to be able to share with others. So thank you so much for your time and what you're doing. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up another lecture of the HBCU Success Show. Please help me in thanking Lieutenant Colonel Retired Lawrence Robinson for being here with us today. Comment below. What did you take away from this conversation? He gave us so much great advice, so much wisdom and lessons that he learned. So Help us understand below what you're taking away from this. Make sure you like this video and share it with others that you think will be inspired and encouraged by his journey. Until next time, make sure your potential energy in motion and I'll see you soon.